Yo, what's up? Welcome to the Rick Thorne Show. This episode is going to go off because I have BMX legend R.L. Osborne in the house. We're going to talk about the early, early days of BMX racing, BMX freestyle, his trick team, the companies he started, all the things that he's done for the sport. He's done so much for BMX. I'm so honored to do this interview. I hope you enjoy it. Let's do this. What Yo, up? Man. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. I'm new to this. I'm new to the audio or the video with this thing. I'm trying to figure it out still. So, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Where, up, where's dude? the? Hold on one second, Rick. Right there and there. Turn it up. And down. Okay, cool. Got it. You showing me the volume. Anyways, what's happening? Not that much, dude. Okay, wait. Hold on a second here. Okay, I'm recording. I'm good, dude. What are you up to? Just checking out your wall. I know it's all of me. I'm so arrogant. No, it's not. I'm kidding. I got, I got, okay, check it out. I got Dennis. I got Rooftop. I got Dave Mara. I got Colin, Colin Morrison, Tony Hawk. Nice. Uh, McGrath, Hoffman, Evil Knievel. Uh, I got to get RL up there, dude. I need something signed, bro. I know it's hard to get pictures from other people, you know, because you got to call them up and we don't have any more of those. Well, can you, you know, so I just, I just, Dylan pulled a bunch of stuff out and we had all kinds of stuff. Who's this doing this air right here? Wait, which one? It's on your left. You're going to, if you turn around, you'll hit it. <laughs> you that, one, that one? Come down to. Oh yeah. That's, right me. There. that's me and Dennis did a demo in Hawaii and that was on the ramp. And then the dude sent me this photo. How high are you right there? Uh, I maybe, high. I don't know, maybe, maybe like six feet or seven, maybe. I was never a big air guy. I mean, I never wrote like super high, you know, eight foot was maybe nine, my max. That doesn't look like a very big ramp. No, it was hoopty. You know, you, you remember, you've been to those demos where you show up and you're like, dude, who built this thing? I know, you know it's I mean? like, <laughs> that's high, man. Thanks, dude. Right. Yeah, well, it's all motivation from you. I got to get you on the wall, though, because as a kid, you were all over my wall. And I'm pretty stoked right now to be sitting here talking to you because, you know, I was a Midwest kid looking up to you. You know what I mean? Back in well, the thank day. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, yeah. And I've been watching you, too, man. I've, I've, you've kind of broken out and done gone all these different ways. And that's just amazing to me, you know? Just trying to stay busy, man. I, I mean, hey, look, everything that I approach, I approach, uh, I don't know if you do this, but I approach like riding, like what it takes to be a bike rider. Yeah. And I apply all that. And I was like, oh, it's the same kind of attitude, you know? Yeah. So, over and over and over until you're yeah. ready to kill yourself, right? <laughs> like, like, get up, <laughs> pull this. I was riding this morning. I'm like, why am I doing this? Because I go out some days and it's like, who's riding my bike? It's going so good, you know? Mm -hmm. And then other days it's like nothing will work and it's over the bars, over the bars, over the bars, over the bars, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, man. And then I think of Rodney Mullen and I think, man, Rodney didn't buy that whole thing about good and bad days. He was like, I'm going to be good every day. <laughs> and yeah. So I'm trying to adapt that. It's not helping yet, but we'll see. I mean, I, I think anybody out there that rides bikes or skates is listening. We all go through that. Like some days you think like, oh man, I don't have the energy. The example yesterday, I just rode, I didn't really, I wanted to ride, but I wasn't really trying to push myself, but everything felt really easy. Yeah. Even though it's tricks that I've been doing for a long time. It's so it was cool. I was like, wow, that's weird. And then other days when you really hype, put in the effort, it's not working. This doesn't make sense. You know? So, yeah. Right. And then you're like, on the good days, you're like, okay. What did I eat yesterday? Who did I talk to? What <laughs> yeah. did I do to make this happen? You know, and I, I, I eat in and out double. I eat in and out patties every day, bro. Do you? I didn't yeah, grow up I, with in and out. We, you, you were lucky. You lived in California. It's you. It's like whatever is probably. Yeah. 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 I'm down, man. I, I do the, um, I mean, I try to eat healthy because my family eats really healthy, you know? Yeah. But I get so much energy from sugar caffeine and hamburgers man it i die i just go to sleep if i'm not eating that stuff so i'm telling you dude i've been getting the patties bro with no meat just the patties and onions i lost oh, you're not weight. so you're not eating carbs no i lost 36 pounds bro uh um, i know right yeah just, so slicing that stuff out so anyways that's how you did it no carbs i mean every like 
I'll, I'll also eat carbs, but through vegetables and stuff. And then maybe on a day, like a cheat day, you have like a granola bar or something. But like, I try to stay away from like chips and sugar and rice and bread. I don't eat any bread. And yeah. then it just starts to fall off. You know, it's crazy. I think it's more the sugar. I love it. I love sugar. Who, man, everyone loves sugar, right? But yeah, it's that's what it was for me if I wanted to keep riding. And what I noticed about you, bro, is like you coming back into it at your, you know, taking a big break. Uh, you probably always rode. I don't know, but like, you no, no I was, I was gone. I was not riding. Okay. So what, what, what was it when you quit riding up until now? How many years was that? Well, not quit riding, but you know what I mean? Like you said, all right. Yeah. Okay. Quit. No, when I, I, when I was done, I was done. I wasn't like right. messing around, you know, I got into business and it's just too hard to, I, I quit for a lot of reasons, but um, I don't know. Let's see. 30 something years I was off. Wow. So I'm 59. I don't know. I'm not good. <laughs> Probably 35 years. I don't know. 30, 35 years. And that's amazing though, because a lot of dudes that take that big of a break can't come back and do anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, whether it's their body or their bike or their mentality or just the fear factor or all these other things. And I just see, I've been watching you on Instagram and it's like, you're getting better and better and better. And I just, I think it's pretty rad because not, not a lot of people can do that, dude. You know? Yeah. It's, um, it's hard with all the injuries and migraines and everything I got to deal with, you know, it's uh recovery time is really important. And I get hurt a lot now. I ride way over my head, like, especially if I'm on dirt jumps, man, you know, your brain's going, Oh, you got this man. It's, you know, 10 foot vertical takeoff and a 20 foot gap with a, freaking cliff in the middle you know and um and i'll try it but yeah I, I just end up crashing and crashing and crashing and crashing you said you get migraines bad well here's the story i've had migraines i got ran over when i used to race motorcycles i got ran over on a motorcycle on a track i was on the wrong track started then and then 20 25 years ago they were severe 24 7 in and out throwing up crawling on the floor wow um, and I had surgery for it. It got so bad. I found the guy. Everybody's like, there's no such thing as migraine surgery. And I found a guy in Houston, Texas. He goes, yeah, I'll do it. They cut up the back of my neck like six inches. They cut under my eyes and they cut the side of my head five hours. And they do something with the nerves. I don't know what, but I'll tell you what, that decreased it 70%-ish, what? maybe a little That's more. Good. I couldn't. I'd leave in the morning with a pile of drugs in my pocket in case I migraine, you know, I migraine on tour buses in the, in the Alps and in uh, what you call it, uh, customs, you know, 500 people waiting to get through customs. I'm on the floor crawling around, throwing up, you know, wow. been everywhere. It's pretty, you don't even care anymore after a while. It's like, you know, but yeah, I don't do that anymore, but I still got to, when I start to get one, I still got to relax, you know, chill out. Yeah, no, I hear you. Just helping, does riding help with that? I mean, I don't know. I think riding help for me helps with everything, but I guess if you have a migraine, it sucks to ride to do anything. But I just know that with, with riding, it always just seems to make my life so much better. <laughs> you know, I know. Don't, you know, it seems like if I don't ride, things get worse. Right. So if I do ride, um, you know, as long as if I get concussions really easy now, I don't know why, but um, whenever I get a concussion, there's always a host of things that come along with that, you know? So, um, but yeah, I'd say um, it, it keeps you going, keeps your brain going, causes me to focus, you know? Um, and then you get that thrill of getting closer to a move, you know? Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. Or, you know, so yeah. Well, you know, dude, you like, I don't know where to start, man, because you've done, well, we've already started, but where to go from here, because you've done so much stuff, right? Like in your life. And I guess what I wanted to ask you, what got you into riding? Because you, you got into it, it the listeners out there, RL got into it when it wasn't on TV, when it wasn't like a thing, when it wasn't in anything, it was just like no. kids, on, kids on bikes. Right. And so what, what got you into just riding? Um, you know, I was always into motorcycles and mini bikes. And, and at four, I had a Sears. I think I got my first Sears bike. And I was trying to do wheelies and jumps on it instantly, you know. But there wasn't, 
there was nobody. I didn't have friends to ride with. There's friends that I hung out with. My um, my half brother would do wheelies with me. You know, but this guy used to ride a Honda Elsinore um, with the gray tank. And he used to do wheelies all the way down the street. And I used to go, man, if I could do that on my bike, I'd be happy. <laughs> you know, so I, I, uh, I wanted to get to that point, you know, but yeah, that's, I, I just been into bikes and motorcycles forever. I don't, I'm not really a, I don't understand baseball to be honest with you. I don't get, there's a kid out there that's less coordinated or as uncoordinated as me throwing a hard rock at me. How does that work? And I don't have any control over it, you know. Soccer didn't do much for me. I'm I like Supercross, BMX, ramp, street, the freestyle motorcycle stuff, you know. So it was this riding on the street with the kids or by yourself. And was it was it the feeling that it gave you that made you want to uh keep riding? It seems like that would have been the only the main focus, right? Yeah, we started doing jumps and then um, you know, we had after a while. You know, when I got in, I don't know, six, seven, eight, we had four or five guys that would ride. We'd ride together, go build, you know, digging and building jumps was, that was like going to church, man. It was just great to dig and build a jump and look forward to hitting it. And, and then, you know, by the time I was eight or nine, 10, then I had 18 year old friends that were right. We, it was a pack of us, man. It was just when we just go to the park and ride and screw around and do stupid stuff, you know. And then this other guy, we would build jumps on these 50 gallon containers, put a tire on it, piece of wood, and we'd fly over the jump to the landing. And we just kept moving it back. And we would do that every day, every day. So it was just uh, it was something I did with my friends. It was great, you know. Where was it when you, when you, when you guys, I, mean, I think that's how like a lot of us old school started, but I also kind of started because I saw the magazines. Well, I rode bikes, but then it wasn't until I started doing tricks to where I was like, whoa, what is this? You know, even though I had a bike and we rode around the neighborhood and stuff. Do you remember that point where it was like, okay, we're like riding, we're having fun. And now it's like, now it's this thing called freestyle. Like there had to be a point. Was there a point where like, you were like, oh, let's do tricks. You started to develop that. Cause it all, did you start, you raced for a long time too, right? Didn't you? That's so funny. I'll put it this way. When I was riding BMX, there was no BMX. You know, I'd go in a swing shop and I, I had these big ape hangers on my bike and they kept snapping. And the lady got pissed at me for like three years. She was just, you can't do that stuff. And eventually the third year she sponsored me. Shut up, lady. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, she was cool. She was, her name is Pauline and Redondo Beach Cyclery. And, and uh, she awesome. sponsored me and started giving me handlebars. Oh, sick. So when, when I was started riding BMX, there was no BMX. There was just me, a couple of my friends, basically guys that did wheelies. Then uh, my dad and I went to city council meetings and got permission to put a track together. And then from there, we heard that there was stuff in Soledad that was going on. And that's where like Bob Hanna was racing bikes, David Clinton, Bobby Encinas, Stu Thompson, you know, and so we had kind of started probably about the same time as them, Scott Brighthop. And then we got caught up in their thing, you know. So, um, yeah, when I was racing mini, cycle, mini bikes, um, Ernie Alexander and his wife, Suzanne, were the ones handling the mini bike races at Indian Dunes, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we went to Soledad, he was the guy that started the NBA, National Bicycle League. So he was putting on bicycle races which was kind of a trip. They moved over too, you know? Awesome. But yeah. So um, yeah, I've been there. I was there to watch go from riding, racing on a grass track with chalk lines to Soledad, which was when Scott Brighthop came into it and there's doubles downhill, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, yeah. And then on any Sunday came out, that was a big thing, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. But there was no BMX when I was jump. I had jumps and stuff like that. And there was just me and a couple of my friends. That's all I knew. I, and I didn't know anybody or hear of anybody doing anything crazy. And the, and the bikes obviously weren't set up for 20 inch, like race style bikes. Right. They were like the old school. Uh, they were old school. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then people started making their own friends like Marvin church and his dad built the first, well, not the first, but I don't know. Then a triangle frame started kind of, you know, you'd use a 
a Schwinn rear end, and then you put a triangle front end on it, you know, and your dad would weld it for you. That started coming out. And then there was Webco and all these companies that started to come in. Um, but it was fascinating to watch that um, come together. It's more fascinating now. Back then, it was just like I was either racing motorcycles or BMX, you know. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And then you asked me how freestyle came out of that? Yeah, or just, just kind of like where – I love the history and I think you have so much of it and you're such a legend in, in this sport. Uh, yeah. Just like, you know, I remember just real quick when we used to race, cause we started out racing, but we, we were riding quarter pipes and stuff and, and doing flatland stuff in the parking lot. And there was a point where I was like, all right, I'm done with racing. Like I'm going to yeah. be a freestyler. But for me, it was like, there was already like, you guys were the generation before us. So there was already in my mind, like, Oh, I could be a freestyler because there was an option for you. Like, well, you always have an option, but you know what I mean? Like for you, it wasn't like, Oh, I could either race or freestyle. It was like, right. where was that point where you're like, you were started, you're racing a lot. And you're just like, dude, I want to be a freestyler, but freestyle was new. Yeah. Right. So was it that being part of that movement? What was that feeling like? Like, what do you remember that moment is what I'm asking. Like where you were like, yeah, yo, I'm done with this. I'm going to do this. And it was new and no one even knew what it was. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I was racing BMX and when, when the NBA was running stuff and it was Soledad and Silmar, the jumps were big, doubles, downhill. It was like motocross. Right. And then the jumps got smaller and people started wheeling over the jumps and it became a, it was just different. It wasn't as fun for me. And I, I was racing seven different races per week, you know, different places per week. Wow. And I burned out and by the time I was 13 or 14, my dad was getting ready to go to the races. All my friends are in the car and I, and I, I rode away and he goes, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go ride my bike. I'm not racing anymore. And I quit. I went back at 16 and raced local pro with some of my friends, but I was done, man. It was, it was, um, wasn't like what me and my friends were doing jumping, you know, mm-hmm. it was speed jumping and staying low to the ground and stuff like that which i i get you know i mean those guys are amazing now but just the old style was huge jumps man huge jumps all ages rode the same track too um downhill sliding through berms you know you had time to pass it was like wait all ages rode against each other no all ages it would be like 10 to 13 okay and 14 to 17 and then and then eventually got individual but um, I mean, I was 10 riding huge jumps, same jumps that the pros were, well, they weren't pros yet, but that the experts, 18 year old experts were riding, you know, which was great. I, I mean, it was just a whole different sport, you know, yeah. you like watching supercross if they'd never left the ground, you know, it right. just, it's, a, it's a different type of racing, you know? Absolutely. So, I that, quit. so you just quit. You're like over it. Well, I just told I just told my dad, which is hard to do. I go, I'm not doing this anymore, you know. And I didn't, and I didn't go back for like three years. But um, my friends and I went back to jumping, and we're starting to do like take our hands off and trying to do 360s over jumps and stuff. And Bob Harrow was an artist for the magazine. He came to live with us. He came to live with us in our house, and um, he wasn't. He wasn't really into the whole BMX thing, but he could do a rock walk. Oh, cool. Yeah. And we were just like, whoa, that's heavy, man. And he was starting to roll backwards a little bit, you know? And um, then Bob and I started to ride together at Larry's Donuts. And that's that kind of from there, it, our, the competition between us was heavy, you know? Yeah. It built. It built and built and built. And um, it was way more fun. You know, it was just way more fun. And from there, I just was on on the road, you know, from 16 with Mike Buff, man. We were never home. We were just, we didn't even know what, if we were in Switzerland or Tennessee or Saudi Arabia, it was like, you know, you have no idea where you are. And that, it, that got pretty monotonous, but interesting though, you know. Yeah, well, it's a great experience. Uh, I want to ask you before I get into the touring and the and the um, the Bob Haro and the, all these, you know, when you were a freestyler and doing the BMX Action Trick team and stuff. I wanted to ask you when you were racing, did your dad start BMX Action Magazine at that time? 
Yeah, we were racing in Soledad, which is one of the first tracks, which, by the way, the beginning of BMX has a huge amount to do with Scott Breithaupt. Yeah. Huge, man. He was like, I don't even think he had his driver's license and he was holding big races, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, he got us into the Coliseum. We raced at the Coliseum and the Yamaha Gold Cup, which he put on. I think he was like 18, you know? Yeah. yeah and we're in the Coliseum, man. It was crazy. Wow. And I forgot the question you asked me. Oh, no, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I was saying like when, when you were, when you were ra- like, okay, I guess I'll ask it. What year did you, your dad start BMX Action Magazine? All right. I don't know. Okay. So were you raised, <laughs> were you racing though, uh, before the magazine? Cause the rumor I always heard is that oh, yeah. Your, yeah. your dad started the magazine because you liked riding. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, we were way before there was even races. Me and my friends were hitting jumps and um, we come down this hill and hit a wood jump, you know, where the plywood's like halfway snap yep. and just fly through the air. And, and if we didn't crash, we were stoked. And, he goes, man, I don't, uh, I'm not too sure about that, <laughs> you know, cause I know he's taking hospital and, and everything like that. And, um, yeah, I think he told me at one time, you know, I'm, you're having a good time, but it's not going to do any, you're not going to go anywhere with this. Right. It's not, nothing's going to happen. Right. And, uh, and you know, at what, nine years old or something, I'm like, I don't care. I'm, I'm not looking for a job right now. I'm having fun with my <laughs> friends, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's was he started the magazine because he got into what I was doing. Then he wow. set up the city council meeting and got a track going. I just sat there next to him, like you know, I didn't know what to do. Yeah, and um, then he started driving us to the races. And some uh, a lady had bicycle motocross news. It was a newspaper, and she wanted to sell it to him. And he thought for that I could start a magazine. And there's the plant, you know. Wow. So, wow. So you take, uh, so you get all the credit for all this stuff, bro. No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. If you would have never been in BMX, like, you know what I mean? Like should have been crazy. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, that's pretty cool. There's, you know, there's no, I couldn't see what people were doing in the Valley, what kids were doing. Yeah. You know? So I just knew in my neighborhood, nobody was riding, you know, until I got older. Um, but man, he was a fireman. And he's a fireman putting a magazine together. You know, that's, that's expensive. That's a lot of money into a sport that doesn't really exist yet. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And that's big balls right there, you know, mm-hmm. big balls. And, um, and then he started posting the wins and uh, people started getting sponsorships and stuff like that. So the magazine, maybe, it, maybe it wasn't first, but the impact was massive. You know what I mean? I mean, I yeah, absolutely. I remember being in, I don't know, like I'm from Missouri, so they had quick trips. They're like 7-Elevens. And I remember looking down and seeing a magazine and I was like, I had never seen it, a BMX published in a, you know what I mean? Like what the, and so I would already been riding, but that's what got me into it. And it was BMX Action was the first magazine I ever picked up. Um, yeah. I just think that's an amazing story. Um, so you started the magazine and that your dad's awesome. So you started the magazine, um, you're racing, you decide you want to freestyle and then you guys form the BMX action trick team, right? Right. Um, so was that trick team already there before you, you and buff before, did you guys race together as that team before you freestyled? No. Um, Bob and I were the first BMX action trick team, Bob Harlow and I, Oh, no way. I didn't know that. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and cool. they had a skate ramp out in, um, I don't know if our first show was at a pizza hut, me and Bob, or if it was in Chandler, Arizona on a plexiglass half pipe that was made by Rad Ram, which was gnarly because it was at a BMX race. So it was covered with dust. I don't know if you ever rode plexiglass. Slippery. The dust on it. It's like ice, right? And this thing's yeah. huge up on a trailer with, anyways, long story. But, um, and then, um, Still a rad story though. I mean, all this stuff's rad, bro. Yeah, we used to jump. We had a jump, and we would jump into the transition to get our speed going. And that jump into that landing and that transition was like a double. You know, oh, best wow. feeling. Best feeling. You know. Um, and then um, 
Bob went his way and we, Bob Har and I used to surf every day, fight like brothers, you know, um, cause we were living together, you know? Yeah. Um, was so, the competition but, to, did the competition get in the way being that close? Cause you guys competition are both, was both, both insane. leaders. Competition was insane. And Bob didn't like to work on the ramps or carry stuff, you know, and I'm like, screw this man. <laughs> and, uh, he liked to show up and ride. Well, those ramps got to get somewhere, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll, let me back up. I rode with Bob and John Swanigan. John Swanigan, no one ever talks about him. He was huge in this, man. John was as good as Bob. Wow. In getting it all. He was doing all the stuff Bob was doing. But you didn't hear about him because he was in San Diego, right? But I rode skate parks with him and bought with him and Bob. And uh, both of them were carving all over the place. We used to go ride San Diego. And then Bob and I would ride every skate park we could get to, you know? Yeah. And, um, and then, yeah, the competition got between us, got kind of strained, you know, um, because, you know, he was just very competitive and so was I, you know? And then, so Bob and I split and Mike Buff got on the team, man. And that was like, man, that was the best because Mike is the most entertaining person. If you ever go on the road, that's who you want to go with, man. He's just funny as hell. But um, awesome, yeah. And Mike Buff, you know, he's got huge nuts. He'd do anything. Good, great rider. Um, and so we started riding together and doing shows at like Marine Land and CBS News and all this other stuff. And uh, how far do you want me to go with this? As far as you want to go, because I love it all, dude. I, I okay. you know, as the. Mike, I just remember seeing you and Buff as a trick team. I'm learning a lot right now. I didn't know Hara was on the team, and I just – it's crazy. Yeah, just keep keep going, man. Yeah, Bob and I were first, and uh, and then he built his own quarter pipe at his office, you know, because he was making those number plates. See, Bob used to go to the races with us because um, he's, he's an unbelievable artist. And if you were racing and you didn't have a Bob Hara number plate, not with the ears, just a straight number with hand-cut numbers – you weren't, you weren't into it. You know what I mean? He was, he was the man and all the pros wrote his number plates and they were custom made. And then he made the ones with the ears on him, you know? Yep. And uh, then he eventually got his own office, built his own ramps, you know, and he was silently practicing, you know? Mm -hmm. So Mike Buff and I were like, all right. So um, Mike and I would just start going through skate parks Um we used to ride this one in Marina del Rey. Check this out. We used, we got there on one of the first or second days, and Fred Blood was doing a six foot five forty over a canyon on roller skates with four wheels per shoe. Wow! And I was just like, <laughs> I mean, we were we were starting to think about errors. In fact, there was a guy there on a a gray bike that was airing out of a ten foot bowl with two feet of vert, and he was airing about two feet. Was that was that Jeff Watson? No, this this is uh I've heard you, Jeff. You got you guys were before Jeff, weren't you? I think you were. Yeah, right. Dominic said that Jeff went way back. Um, I think Jeff passed away, right? I'm not sure. I think he did. Um, I'm not sure though on that. I probably shouldn't have said that, but um, no, it's okay. yeah, I, I'm not sure how he came into it, but I do remember watching this guy air out of the bowl and going, "That's not possible." You know, because Bob Harrow and Buff and Swanigan, we were jumping hips. We would like the bowl would come like this around and we would go from bowl to bowl over the hips, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> which is great. You know, it was like the perfect jump every time. Didn't ever get wet or nothing. But um, so then, you know, Buff and I were touring and man, I think out of seven years, we, the majority of the seven years we were on the road, you know, either in a truck or we'd fly out of the tour, get on the plane, go to, you know, Europe and tour there, come back, get on the road and just constantly, man. And it was, it, it wasn't as glamorous as everybody thought. You know, everybody's like, Oh man, you're not. No, it was like, we get off a plane. There's two guys waiting there. Right. They grab your stuff and they've already cleared you through customs. You run through customs throw all your stuff and your bike in a car, you go to a TV station and you're on in five minutes, you're putting your bike together, 
go right on this slippery surface, do that, go to another place, you know, shoot photos here, promote this. And it wasn't like we were out cruising around, you know? Yeah. It was work. It was yeah. different. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it got fun at times and yeah. sometimes we would be so tired and jet lagged that we just couldn't keep it together, you know, and, and Mike would start making funny jokes and we'd joke about inside things, you know, and start cracking up on TV. It was great. But, um, you guys were the first uh, uh, trick team to tour, right? Freestyle team? Well, Bob Haro and I did shows in a, at a pizza hut. And um, we did shows in Chandler, Arizona, which was weird because I was riding in front of all my BMX guys I used to race. And here we are on a half pipe that no one's ever seen. Wow. That was a weird feeling. In fact, we would do a lot of races, you know? And it was really weird to see all my friends I used to compete against, you know, that were now like really fast pros and yeah. we're there doing a show, you know, it's pretty cool. We have weird too, but they're like, what, what's going on? Yeah, for sure. So you, so you guys the just, best. Yeah, man. Ugh, everything was fresh and new. You know? Well, not only that, but BMX, you show up sometimes five o'clock in the morning, wait for your first moto race that, wait four hours, do your next one. Sometimes in Vegas, it's 110 degrees. You're there for two days all day, right? And um, we would come in, do a 15-minute show, and it was like, see? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll drive around in our rental car. And we sold. Around. Yeah. <laughs> and, we were, and we weren't on These dirt guys. very much. Yeah. <laughs> like, ah. So um, it was great, man. That was a lot more back to why we started to ride, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah, the feeling and going back to that. I remember seeing you must have been mid early, early eighties. I saw you on that's incredible. Was that it? You're racing the yeah. horse. Yeah. Yeah, dude. How did that come about? A guy from uh, Jamie Budge from national Enquirer. He was a writer for national Enquirer, And um, he goes, I have this idea. And he goes, do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. You know? And, and he had backing from that's incredible. Right and the National Enquirer. Um, so we, we met out this equestrian center and this lady that I was going to race who races horses. <laughs> um, she's like, this is ridiculous. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to smoke this guy. I didn't have a chance against this horse, right? So we had a drag race. I don't know, 100 yards or something like that. And I smoked the horse. Yeah. Um, this is on a running track, you know, DG, slippery. I beat the horse. And uh, she rode off and Jamie came over and he's like, uh, we got a problem. <laughs> she was pissed. And uh, she set it up. There was a horse that was in Europe somewhere that was being trained for the Olympics that were coming up or something. And she had that horse flown in <laughs> to, uh, cause she doesn't like losing, right? She was competitive, man. Wow. She yeah. The so, horse. Yeah. That, <laughs> That whole thing was an experience. I don't know how far you want me to go into that, but there was some I mean, fun things that I, happened. I think it was cool because like, I remember when, you know, when we when you first get it back then, you're getting into things, every little thing you see, you're a sponge. Like I, you know, you yeah. look at the ads, the stickers, where your sticker placement is, who rides for what, what are those bars? Like, you're just like, where's that spot? What's that trick? So when, and you would never see anything on TV. So anytime I would see anything about bikes on TV, I was like, what? And it yeah. was like super inspiring. And I specifically remember you racing that horse. And I was like, dude, that dude is rad. You know, it's like, yeah. and you ended up beating the horse at the end. Didn't you? Didn't you guys do, but didn't you do a whole race where you're like, you're jumping and the horse is jumping and you guys jump over water. Right. Yeah. I won one and she won two, but, they know on a track how many full strides a horse is going to take. Mm -hmm. They know exactly. Well, she was whipping this horse so hard because he got the gun freaked him out that he skipped two strides. Imagine a horse spread out. He skipped that much, you wow. know? Wow. And, uh, but you know, it was kind of a thing, but I don't know if you remember Spanky Spangler. Yep. Stud guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he was my, um, like my bodyguard for making sure all the stunts were cool. You know, I don't forget what he stunt coordinator. Right. Right. And, um, you know, they built the track. I came back the next day and he goes, 
come here, man. We got to go talk about this. And he goes, that jump look okay to you? And I go, looks fine to me. And he goes, that's two feet higher than it was yesterday. And it's spread farther apart. The producers came in at night and built up the jumps and spread them farther apart, right? And I was already jumping blind. I'd have a hedge and a pole. I couldn't see my landing, right? Right. And I go, hey, you're right. And he went and chewed out the producer and those guys that raised that stuff. I mean, he was pissed, man. Why did they raise it? Did they ever say? They wanted me to be higher. They wanted me to be higher. But I'm thinking, man, I'm trying to beat this horse, man. I can't be that much time in the air, you know? Yeah, yeah um, you got to stay kind of low. You know what I mean? You got to yeah. get in there. Yeah. I'll never forget that, that he uh, he was really paying attention, you know, and want everything to be right for me. And I appreciate cool. that so much, you know? Yeah, because um, most people don't care. Yeah. <laughs> no, some do. But yeah, that's cool. I remember that. Yeah. Well, you've you know, been doing stuff in Hollywood. In fact, I was really impressed with everything you've done. So you know what that's like, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember when... I went to do um, I'll just, a quick story. I don't want to make this about me, but I got to tell you a story real quick because we're talking about this. Is right. I went and did Mall Cop. And when I first did Mall Cop, uh, the Paul Blart movie, I thought I went in for the audition and they wanted me to take over the mall. So I'm like, everybody down, freeze down. Da, 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 da. And they're like, oh, you got the part. And so I, I didn't have any idea I was riding at all until – uh, a couple of days before I was leaving and like bring your bike. And I was like, what? And then we did a table read. And then I was like, okay, Oh, I am riding. So the other guys that were in the, in the film, they, I think they had already kind of briefed them on what their stunt was going to be. Okay. Cause they were doing right. stunts. I thought, I, I thought this was an acting role, which I was wanted more because I didn't want to be put like in the category of always being the bike rider in movies, you know, cause I'm not going to go far with that. Uh, you know what I mean? You're only going to do so much. And so anyways, long story short, there was a big jump, a, a big, like, you know, 60 foot gap. And I'm not, I'm, that's not my style of riding. I've never been a long distance jumper. And that's a and big gap. <laughs> a big gap. And they're like, do it. And I was like, dude, I can't like, I, not, I can't, but I'm like, it's just not my thing. And I just remember like they had to come up with something else different, but it was, it was almost like they were salt, like not salty, but like, dude, we, like someone must have informed them that I, this is what I was my stunt that I wanted to do in the film. And I had no idea. I just went to, I went to the set and they're like, you jump in this. I'm like, dude, I don't do distance jumping. And it created this thing, you know? And I was just like, so I know the feeling of like, if you woke up and you went and you're like, Hey, this is, I can't even see what I'm doing. And you want me to jump this. And, and they're like, do it, dude, do it. And you're like, bro, I, you need to change this back. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the pressure's on, right. It's not like three weeks before, it's yeah. like the camera set up. The guy's like, okay, we're all, oh, by the way, there's a 60 foot gap, you know? And so yeah, didn't you feel exactly. that pressure? Oh yeah. So I just, I just said, you know, we figured out something else to do in it, but, and it was still cool. It still worked out, but you know what their, they, their vision of what they wanted for that, that scene wasn't exactly what their vision was, but at the same time, you know, if, if it was one of those things where, Hey, you got two weeks to do this, I would have went and, you know, cause I've always been kind of spooked on, on the big distance jumping. Yeah. It's not my style of riding. I respect it. I probably could do it if I really put my mind to it, but it's right. something that it's not, not my, my thing. So I just felt like a lot of pressure on set. Kevin James is looking at me like, dude, and I'm in a nice way. And then all the producer and the director is like, do it, bro. And I'm like, dude, you know, it's like, uh, hmm, uh, yeah. uh, you know, so I get it, bro. But it's it's all it's all entertainment uh, for yeah. me. On the that's incredible thing when you're riding, and probably a lot of other people out there, the the old school BMXers, we were inspired, dude. It was just it made me it made me feel like what I'm doing makes sense. Like what I'm doing matters. Like even though it did, you know what I mean. But like what I'm doing, like is getting some my world is getting some credibility on the almighty TV screen. You know what I mean? And it was just like, it was just a moment while I, I always remembered, like it motivated me to ride. So. I appreciate yeah. that. But you know, back to what you were doing in, in mall cop or is that what it was called? Mall cop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to talk to somebody else that understands that, you know, when you go to shoot these things, it's not like, Oh, Hey man. And there's roses at your feet. And, you know, you got all this stuff and are you sure that's okay? It's not like that. You know, it's, it's really nice to feel somebody that understands that whole point of view, you know? And that's what Spanky did for you. So, right. What Spanky did for me. And I was, I was so grateful because he was 
a god in doing stunts. I mean, he was nuts, man. He would take a Odyssey four wheeler and jump anything. You know, he was nuts. And um, I remember it was that. Dude. Cool. Do you still do you still talk to him or? No, no. Do you did you cross paths with Pat Romano at all in when you're doing all your movies and stuff? No, but that's another dude I would see on commercials and all the Mountain Dew commercials and uh, uh, back in the day, all those, uh, you know, I'd, I'd see I'd see him in a bunch of commercials. Yeah. Um, with, and he was the first that I ever knew that was doing a, uh, uh, yeah, like a free, did he have a free coaster? What's the way no. you pedal backwards? Direct drive, direct drive. Yeah, that's it. I remember yeah. seeing him on a commercial where he's spinning, you know, so it was, he, he got into Hollywood pretty much, right? A lot, pretty yeah. He was uh, from what I heard. He was he was big, you know, because when him and I got together, he he was showing me, you know, he was in the, with the Ice Capades and Peggy Fleming was still skating at, at shows and stuff. He knew all those people, so yeah, he that was his main thing, you know. Yeah, but you gotta think about this. Pat rode without brakes, no brakes, and so they're like, oh, it's direct drive, but he would do boomerangs around the front of the bike without touching anything. And he could just go for days, right? So rad. Yeah, there was a lot to be admired there. Yeah, and well, his. A... Oh, go go ahead. ahead. No, I was gonna say, it's making me think about the movie Rad. Yeah, yeah. Well, you and you were in Rad too, right? Yeah. Right. So, I remember seeing those boomerangs in the Simi the Angel. That's what just hit my head. You know, she said doing a bunch of boomerangs, right? Yeah. How was how was how was the movie Rad though compared to? Uh, you know, the, the, that's incredible. It was rad more of kind of uh, you guys were treated more like these because at that point you were top, top professional, right? Well, what happened there was um, I had been touring, right? And I was actually, I was with Ronnie Wilton on the road and we've been on the road for a long time. So I, I toured, he'd done some stuff with Bob, Mike Buff. Now I was with Ronnie and I, I hit a spot, man, where I was like, I was sitting in a tub. I had a glass of whiskey in my hand and my head was hanging down and I was just numb. I know you know what that feels like, right? You're yeah. just, you don't know what's up, what's down. You're just worn out. Yep. And my manager called me with the movie Rad and they were offering me to, to direct the bike riders and ride in the movie. And I was like, I turned it down. I said, I can't do it. I'm, there had to be a point where I, I was like, man, I got to get my head together, man. I'm like, I was just done, you know? And I had, they made me really like three more offers. And I said, uh, you should call Eddie Fiola. And that's who I recommended. That's who did it. So I just did the opening and the closing and I'm on the cover. And I, I did some promo stuff in San Diego with Talia Shire. Um, and that was, that was about it. You were just burnt out. Yeah, over. I'm, I don't know if you know what it, what that's like. It's like you hit a wall. You got everybody in the world telling you this is the opportunity of a lifetime. This is it, and it's like I I didn't even have time to get over jet lag, man. I was like just running around for like seven years, you know, and um, I was just like I was numb. I had no feelings anymore. I was heavy into Pink Floyd and just sulking all day, you know. Yeah, but you were competing at that time too, right? The AFA days. No, when Ronnie and I were riding, there wasn't competition yet. No. Know? Wait, so that, that was must a have been, event. what, 83, 84 or something like that? When the first competition came? No, like when you guys were doing your doing the, the, the touring a lot and stuff. Because what didn't AFA come out around 85 or something like that? I, feel like I don't know. I'm really not good with dates. My memory's not that good. But okay. um, but I, I, I do remember the feeling of, once all you guys started riding, you guys got really good, right? And Buff and I didn't really get to practice because we were either sleeping in an airport, doing a show somewhere, building the sport. You know what I mean? Because we go, to yes. they had no idea what freestyle was, you know? So we're all over the world doing this. And, uh, and a competition is starting. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then there was like Woody and Martin who were getting really good. You know, some really good ground riders coming up. And um, so I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to compete, you know. 
And so I, uh, I slowed down on my touring and I started practicing for competition, you know, started doing a lot of my own tricks, um, new tricks, started focusing on competition because that was the direction it was going, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember I, I went to AFA. The first AFA I went to was in 1985. Um, and I, you know, through the years I'd always, you know, I, I grew up with Dennis McCoy. So everyone out there, all the OGs know Dennis, you know, Dennis, uh, you were hanging with Dennis, Dennis at that time. Yeah. I met Dennis in 1982 at a mall. I came out of the mall with my sister from the arcade and I was new to the neighborhood and I'd been riding, but I, you know, I built a little quarter pipe in my backyard and was riding by myself because I was into riding and I had the magazines, but I didn't know anybody, but I just loved riding. And I walk out and I see Dennis with all these dudes doing these tricks with a boom box for money. <laughs> and I was like, who are these dudes? Yeah. And, uh, it was a BMX brigade which I eventually became a member as a crew of us that rode and Dennis was basically the ringleader. And I just, you know, me and him clicked and we became best buds and uh, uh, we rode 24 seven nonstop together. So everything that Dennis, you know, was experiencing, I was there as his, as his best friend watching this happen. And, and, you know, I would hear all these stories about the contests and stuff. And then that's gradually or naturally what I ended up following in is because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I followed, I followed all the contests and uh, I remember the first time I met you was at a contest. It yeah. was in 19, I think it was the 1988 King of Earth finals, but it was in 89 and it was in Irvine. And I remember Vision Street where I sponsored it. And I went out there with Matt and that was a contest where Matt was still amateur, but he competed pro and he competed both classes and high right. air and won all of the shit. Yeah. I'm like, dude. And so I remember I fell or something and I, I met you on the flat bottom and it was the most inspiring thing because you gave me a pair of hammer shin guards, bro. Really? Yep. I wish I still had them. They were the OG ones too. Like they were green on one side. Does that yeah. One yeah. And I was like, what RL just gave me shin pads. Like what? <laughs> and uh, that's where I, I didn't like meet, meet you, but that's where like we, you know, exchanged and I wanted to talk to you, uh, lead into like that, those whole days of like, you, you're an entrepreneur in so many different ways. You started hammer, uh, let us, can you let us know what hammer is for everyone, anyone listening? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I was tired of ruining my shins. And then it was like, they, they get so sensitive after you hit them a hundred million times. Right. Yeah. So, um, Billy Maestro who was one of the owners of body glove was um, he was about 200 yards from my house. Their whole company was right. So I went and talked to, to him and I said, Hey man, here's what I want to do out of neoprene, you know, and that's who made my first hammer pads. I mean, they would do my orders for me and they had metal mesh in the front and stuff, you know, Yep. Um, but they were cool looking, never had a problem with them. And um, that worked out really good. And then we went with the knees and we wanted something that, wouldn't get hung up on your bike because yeah. I, I was wearing rector knee pads. I did a look back and my lever went inside my knee pad in the cup. And that's how I stayed till I hit flat bottom. And I was like, I never want that to happen again. You know, those are horror stories. Like, Oh yeah. 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 And, and it's so long from you're like six feet out and you just see that flat bottom and you're just going to be like a rock, you know, but whatever. Anyways, that's how hammer started. And, um, yeah, I, I, we get so much comment about start it again, do it again, you know, and all this stuff, but it's, it's really hard to manufacture anything right now. Really. Yeah. But that's well, where the whole hammer thing came. Well, the look, I love the look. I remember that ad you were, you're were sitting there and you had the two girls and your whole look with the, with the cut bandana and the sleeves cut off. I remember that. I was, I was like, what is this? You, you always seem to be like, able to reinvent yourself and that's the longevity to anything i think that you do is it like reinventing yourself you know what i mean would you agree yeah. to that yeah absolutely absolutely just like you leaving bikes and and all of a sudden i was seeing you in these movies and you weren't like just in the background you weren't like an extra you were like prominent you had lines you know what i mean and uh and you're riding in them and i was just hearing all kinds of stuff about you and i was really impressed that you crossed over you know, thanks. Yeah. That's yeah, not an easy thing to do. You know, it's not because people want to put you in a box for one yeah. and they want to say, Oh, you can't do more than one thing. And I was like, well, yeah, you can. And it's like, and so then you want to do, 
music or you want to do this, you want to do that or comedy or whatever. And so, yeah, it's, but I've learned to just kind of be like, yeah, it doesn't matter what they think. It keeps yeah. them talking about you. And as long as you're doing things that you're doing, the things that you love, see, for me, it's just real quick. A lot of things are, it's all about the expression and about reinventing because I get bored just doing the same thing. You know what I mean? So like, I want to reinvent myself all, all the time and, and the expression factor of having a voice, you know, that's what I like, you know what I'm saying? So I got a good question for you. Go ahead and finish. Sorry. No, no, that's basically it. I don't, I'm, I, yeah. I mean, just wanted to, uh, yeah. But what were you going to ask me? So you've experienced a lot, right? You've been through the whole BMX freestyle thing, Hollywood comedian band. These are, you've experienced multiple things like that are the top favorite things that everybody dreams about doing once in their life. You know what I mean? And do you ever find it hard that you've seen so much? It's like, what do I do now? <laughs> what do I do now? That's look, looks kind of interesting. You know, Can you I, ever have that? No, I mean, no, I, I, I don't, uh, I guess the way that I interpret that is like, do I get bored and be like, well, what am I going to do? I've done all this stuff. There's nothing else left for me to do. I, I don't, because I keep reinventing each of those things. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah a different song, a different style song, comedy, your routine's always changing because you're always, you always need material. You know what I mean? You can't do the same set for like your whole life. You know, you, you grow and adapt and it's like, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier is that everything's about riding, bro. You learn one footer. So like, Oh, cool. You learn yeah. one hander. So you're like, cool. You're like, dude, I can put them together. Oh, put them together in a 360. What put them together in this. So you're always like, and with riding, Lately, I've been writing. I've been actually learning stuff. Um, yeah. So it's just like putting your, putting your, you know, so to answer your question, at times I feel like I'm hitting, not really hitting a wall, but I get maybe a little tired, but not too much because I just keep a positive vibe about it, you know? And so I think there's so much more that could be done for all of us and for myself, I think. And I'm just trying to entertain myself while, while I'm here. <laughs> that's it, man. Trying to entertain yourself. But see, that's it. when you're young, you're like, oh, my God, you guys flew to Arizona? Really? Oh, my, what was, you know, it's like you were on an airplane. And then once you're, you've been around the world, you've been on stages in front of thousands of people and you've signed autographs, you've done everything that comes along with that, you know, and it's like... <laughs> You know, it's like my my family always goes, hey, let's go to Cabo, man. Cause, and it's like, you know, it's just people working and their water's blue like it is here. It's the same thing, you know? Yeah. But I, I'm like, I already seen that, you know? Already. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't have that that thrill that um, I used to have, you know? So, But riding, riding ground is um, hard and you yeah. got you got to earn it, you know? Same thing with ramps, street, whatever. You got to earn it. And there's something in that that is kind of fulfilling that, you know, trying to entertain myself thing, you know? Yeah. Well, Flatland, I've absolutely, I've always said this flat freestyle flatland riding. That's anyone, you know, the tricks on the ground, people that might not know that are watching. That's the, that's more difficult and more it takes more strain and more strength on your body than jumping does. Absolutely. Yeah, You're yeah. doing like a triple decade, you know, a double, de a single decade. Like it's a different kind of thing with your core and your, your, your strength and your arm strength, because you know, you're, you're maneuvering your body around the bike. It's not as if you, you know, you're jumping or doing an air because you know the difference of the two doing an air. You're like, there's a point where you're weightless, you know, yeah. you're like, it's, it doesn't take a lot of physical strength to do a high, you know, to do an air. It does, but it cannot compare to doing like, you know, a cherry picker or something. You know what I mean? So, or it takes, it takes nuts man, to hit that ramp a hundred miles an hour, take in those G forces and try not to hang up. You know, it's, a, um, it still takes strength, but flatland, but I just think flatland is more of a physical strength. Uh, so it's, yeah. to, you know, just to kind of compliment on what you were saying or add to what you were saying about flat it's over and over and over and over and over and over but um you know it's cool i love it what about bully bikes bro how did that come about um because you started your own bike company too another right. amazing thing and you had your own team <laughs> totally out of stupidity it was like 
<laughs> I'm like, this shit's amazing. You're like, no, dude, you know, let me tell you. <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking about this this morning. There's advantages to being book smart and there's advantages to being street smart. And I'm street smart. I schooling and testing and all that stuff is like beyond me. Not good. My kids are great at it. Right. Not me. Um, I forgot what you, what was I talking about again? Oh, no, you're good. Bully bikes. Right. So, um, link or, you know, the BM, BMX had gone, we, we were having a bad economy. Our economy was slowing down. I didn't even know what an economy was. I was like, I don't know, 19, 20 years old or something. And, um, things were slowing down and I was losing sponsors, you know? So I, I didn't think, Hey man, why aren't, I mean, I'm still, I'm on top. Why aren't they paying? Why don't they want to pay me anymore? I didn't really think, Hey, because they're not selling as many bikes. I never crossed my mind. I didn't even know why they were paying me to be honest with you. Um, so I figured <laughs> I'll just start a bike company. That seems next in line, you know? And I had some things I wanted to do and street was coming into it. I was living with Pete Augustine and, um, yeah, Pete. Yeah, man. A lot of story, a lot of yeah. stories with that guy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, about starting street being the first one I ever saw, but anyways. Yo, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Um, so we just started, I was like, let's build this two bikes, you know, and it worked, you know, I mean, it was working and stuff. And, uh, that's where I came from, you know. The graphics on Bully was did Mark McKee do those graphics? Yes. That was Guy a Flatlander. Is. Flatlander on Skyway. I remember that dude. Right? Yeah. Long hair, Asian mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. I think he's Asian. Unbelievable. Unbelievable um artist. Right. And then mm -hmm. so I don't know if you know the story about Steve Rocco and Rodney Mullen. In world industries do you know world industries yeah i heard that that uh well i don't really i'm not quote me if i'm wrong or let me know if i'm wrong but didn't that dude rip all those dudes off rip who off or did rocco rip everybody off or something like that or not what? that i know of. oh no no it's no. different no no <laughs> i don't know what i'm talking about no then i don't know when me and my friends would ride at the huntington beach pier he would be there he would be skating steve was a real good skater right Right. He'd be doing street stuff and things like that. And then him and Per Wellner, Rodney Mullen took me out to lunch and wanted to know how I was doing manufacturing, riding, real estate. And they take me out to lunch and pick my brain. And I was very impressed with that because it's one of my number one, one rules. If you want to know how to do something, I, I wouldn't necessarily go to school. I'd go to a guy that's doing it <laughs> exactly the way you want and just ask him, you know. Yeah. That's straight from the horse's mouth, as they say. Yep. So um, they, Steve was starting his company with Rodney, and, uh, and they were uh, living off selling stickers. They were eating, like, rice and stuff. Wow. And they were starving. You know, and, and long story short, Steve was the first company to sell or to get his company on the um, IPO on the stock market. You know, so he wow. sold out. He's living in Hawaii, doing really good. Rodney's doing really good. But they both lived with me for, I don't know, a year or two. That was an experience, man. Wow. You know who Rodney Mullen is, right? Yeah, amazing. I would, like, I've told the story a million times. It didn't matter if he was sick and throwing up. Didn't matter if it was raining outside, storming, he rode. Two o'clock in the morning, midnight, He'd, and I'd sit in my look down on the parking lot and watch him. And it wasn't, it was practice for him, but it was perfection. It wasn't right. like he was trying to learn something. He had everything down. So um, I had a great experience with Rodney. He's, he is a super deep person. So am I. Um, and we just had really good conversations. Learned a lot from him. Yeah. I just saw him recently on the uh, new Tony Hawk documentary until the wheels fall off. Have you seen that? Yeah. I'm watching. I'm halfway through it. So good. So good. Uh, right. You see him like at the beginning, he's riding that half pipe and they're shooting him and he's just bailing. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that current age? Is that? Yeah. It? Yeah. I think that I think that footage was when 
It might have been because Tony did a 50 at 50. I, th I think that might have been a 900 he did for that, which was a couple years ago or something. Or it might have might have been recent. But I know documentaries take a while to film, yeah. you know, um, that that ramp. Uh, I ride that ramp quite a bit with him when I was going down there during COVID. Um, that's the same ramp that he uses for all of his tours and stuff like the Boom Boom Huck Jam and a lot of his, his events that he does. The ramp's amazing. Tony, that's a whole nother story. He's an amazing individual. You know, it's funny. I, I asked Tony, I'm like, hey, dude, like back in the day when you'd be a pipeline and shit, would there be any, be any, any BMXers there? And he's like, oh, yeah. And he was talking about Jeff Watson. And, and I, because, you know, in my mind, I was like, I saw like Pipeline and Del Mar for the first time with BMXers in it. So from a Midwest kid, I was like, damn, all these bike riders riding this, you know what I mean? Like, and I just, I'd love to see any of that. If anyone out there has any of that older footage, man, if some bike yeah. riders in there would be awesome. Because I knew bikes have always been there since the beginning with pools and banks and everything else. It's just a natural thing. You're going to try to ride it, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. but with, with back to Bully though. So you had a full on team, right? Didn't you sponsor Dominguez? I remember. Yeah. yeah. And man. <laughs> You sponsored a lot of people. You had a whole team, right? What was it? What was it? Okay, you're laughing. What was the deal with Dominguez? Well, you know, Dominguez doesn't practice, right? You know that, right? Oh, he just shows up and goes for it. It's badass. That's it. <laughs> it is. It's because I'm like over and over and over and over. And him and Brian, they show up at a contest and they just learn everybody else's tricks and practice. You're talking about anyone usually, out there. You're talking about Brian Blyther. Just so anyone out there listening. Brian Blyther, yeah. Brian yeah. Blyther and Mike Dominguez are like, ah, oh, yeah. Um, it's just, I love, it's like Ronnie Anderson and BMX and his brother, they're total outcasts, man. They show up on the a starting line of a championship BMX race with a cigarette and a beer, you know? Yeah. Well, and all these other guys are training five hours a day doing starts and stuff. And then Ronnie would win. You're well, talking about the, the, the Patterson brothers, right? No, that's Brent and Brian. Oh, wait. And Ronnie and Richie also race for Patterson. Well, but oh, they, Ronnie oh, okay. Anderson is a wild man. He's like half the size of everybody ripped, right? <laughs> Just big mouth and faster than freaking shit, man. And the complete opposite of what everybody else was doing where they're all big and training and like, yeah. yeah. And he would just show up on the starting line with a beer and a cigarette in his hand, right? <laughs> on the finals in the, in the main event, you know, punk rock um, or punk rock, bro. Yeah, he was ahead of his time, man. Yeah, you know what's crazy? I rode with Dominguez. Vans had this little ramp, uh, like a 10-foot-tall um, vert ramp in their parking lot a few years ago. And so I had not done can-cans in a while, and I was going down there riding a lot. And Dominguez had actually hit me up and said, hey, I'm going to go ride the ramp with you. And this was like a crazy moment for me because being a Midwest kid and, and looking up to all of you and learning these tricks in my backyard and stuff – I ended up relearning can cans or I wouldn't really say relearning, but just did, did them again that day. And Dominguez shot the photo. And I was really? like, what am I doing? Like, this is like, like to answer your question, is there anything else oh, no. that you feel like you're doing all these things? Is there anything else in life that you feel like you do going to, that was one of those moments like, okay, well, I've done. It's yeah. Awesome. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. You guys just shot a photo of some shit he made up in 85 of me at Vans in their parking lot. Wait, aren't I, aren't I like a Midwest kid? I'm not supposed to be here. Am I, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You kind of yeah. still stuck in your head like that. So yeah, he's, he's, he's cool. He's one of my favorite people. Um, yeah, he's cool. Sport, but um, who, inspired yeah, so we, you, who inspired you? Um, Motorcycles probably, yeah. you know, um, and I had a bike, you know, and I, I couldn't afford a motorcycle at the time. So I'm like, do it on a bike, you know, a bicycle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Dominguez and I cut a deal. He, he was coming back, right? Mm -hmm. So I sent him a bike and I started thinking, wait a minute, man, this is Mike Dominguez. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's not practicing. Now, even if it's his comeback, he's not practicing. So I hired Chris Day. I'm like, Chris, this is after a couple months, right? Mm -hmm. well, I need you to go out there and see if Michael's riding, you know, and see if he got the bike. And so Chris came back and I go, did you see the bike? He goes, 
Yep. <laughs> They're on the box? I, no. <laughs> I, I go, where was it? He goes, it's in the backyard, rusting in the rain. <laughs> He goes, it's half put together. It's not even put together. It's just sitting out there rusting. Brand new bike, right? Wow. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I didn't say anything because that's Dominguez. And when he came back, uh, you know, Matt dropped in first and did back-to-back 900s, I think. And Michael did a 900 pretty high out. I'm pretty sure there wasn't a whole lot of practicing, but came pretty close. But – Here's, you know, when, when you hit a ramp, I was, I was at, I was at that contest. Were you? Yeah. I think it might've been like 80, was it 89? Maybe it was in the East coast somewhere. If I remember right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was a King of Earth. And like, that was like his debut, uh, Dominguez on bully. And I was like, wow. All right, cool. You know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember. I was riding. I, I was living. Chris Rothrock was living with me at the time. Oh, uh, cool. remember him. And if you remember on the side of the ramp, everybody put their bikes upside down. That's where they'd store their bikes. And Chris and I think Todd Anderson and I, no, Chris and me and maybe Pete Carney or something, been touring a long time. And Chris was wiped. Uh, we were all wiped out, right? And Chris hung up on an air and went right off the edge of the ramp into everybody's bikes. And Winkle and I were up in the crowd going, oh, shit, man. He just wiped out all these bikes. But... <laughs> What I was going to say is, you know, when you're riding a ramp, okay, if, if you're going up, do both of your tires hit coping going out and coming in? Or is it no. just your front tire? More like the front. Like, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really feel my back tire as much. I think you just, you compress and you come off the lip. Yeah. Um, depends on if, if the coping sticks out, how far it sticks out and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, you know how yeah. it is, right? I think that's not how it works with Dominguez though. Cause I watched him at Del Mar, which I saw Tony Hawk do some amazing things there, but he wrote this big, long full pipe, half pipe. He dives in. And when he would come out, you could hear his tires go click, click. You can hear both tires. He rides straight up, click, click. And when he comes in, click, click. Yeah. I mean, that's Okay. That's insanely hard to do when you're going that fast. Yeah. To just tick both of them with both tires. And then consider that you don't even, you don't even know if your bike's broke. You don't work on your bike. You don't practice. And so it, it was uh, – it, it always was amazing to watch him ride. Him and Brian yeah. together just, you know, so it was just pure natural talent. You yeah, know? magical. I, me- I remember seeing a sequence, uh, I think it was Del Mar, where Dominguez did a – 180 tail whip fly out and he landed but he landed on his seat i think maybe a foot came off but that's before anybody was doing like i know i know blyther made up the tail whip on flat ground right from what i understand am i right about that i don't know i don't know but brian, I just, brian could learn anything in practice at an event you know and it would be 10 feet out it didn't matter you just figure it out and smoother and you know well, yeah, those guys are amazing. They're super cool, chill dudes. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about you. You're, you're coming out with a new bike. Well. Like a, a whole new thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I started back. writing. RL is back. RL is back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got hooked into, um, which I thought was the dumbest thing in the world, the big bikes. You know, Mike Buff, big fat red tires. And I was like, oh, God, that is a dumbest looking bike. And then um, Todd, Lions from SC, gave me one. And I started riding it, man. It was a blast. Mm -hmm. And when you go on these ride outs, like Santa Cruz, 5,000 people on these big bikes. It's insane. It's awesome. Yeah. It's insane. I I just can't tell you all the exciting stuff that goes on, especially after what you and I have already seen in this world. Mm -hmm. It's new. (laughs) Everything that goes on is new. So I started riding and started instantly doing freestyle on them because that's what I come from, you know? Yeah, exactly. So we've been trying to get one made, but it's, we, we've actually got them on order. They're prepaid our prototypes, right? And um, nobody can get any chrome molly. Nobody can hire welders. Everybody's wow. struggling with it. And we, we want to do it American made, you know? And it's called, it's called RL bikes, right? Uh, it's, it's RL American made 
bikes, awesome. I think. Yeah, awesome. You know, there's social media. That's one name. There's this. That's another name. This T-shirt has. I can't remember all the. My son does all that. He puts that all together. You know. Awesome. Which is a huge part of this. I got to say that Dylan, he's the one doing all the social media, sets up all this stuff. You know, and um, that's been huge. Yeah, it seems like you got you got a really close family. That's great. You guys all like you know, involved with each other and around BMX, which is pretty cool. Um, speaking of the ride outs, I'm leaving, uh, I'm doing the one April 23rd in Vegas. I, I recently signed with JT uh, and they're sending me out there to, to do a ride out. And they're like, do, do you want us to bring you a big bike? And at first I was like, man, I ain't selling out. So I'll go out there on my BMX. They're like, listen, I'll give you, we'll bring one so you can ride it. So you have a ride bike. I go, okay, I'll try it. And then I was like, all right, I'll open my mind and I'll give it a try. You know what I mean? I'll ride it. Yeah. It's just a bike. It's just a ride. It's like, yeah. you know what I mean? But I, I, I want to be, I, I just want to be, if I'm riding out and we're riding around, I want to be able to like hit some shit. You know what I mean? It'd be like, right. you know, like. <laughs> so. but, and, and you're going to be kind of unique. I mean, more guys are getting into it that way. Yeah. But I was the same way. I'm like, well, let's do one, eight, let's do a G turn. Let's do, you know, Yeah, yeah. and, um, but, uh, the cool thing is it's, it's about seeing your friends and just riding a bike. Yeah. It's, you don't have to do anything. You know, all the young kids will be doing all that stuff. You just sit there, ride, wheelie, jump, do it if you want to do it, but just seeing your friends, you know, and it's, it's really, and then when you go on the big rides, like LA, that one, man, they closed down all the streets of um, all the main streets in Hollywood, you know, and you just own the streets, man. They got, it's patrolled. It's awesome. Okay. And this, and this is going to be like, probably you're going to be like, dude, that's a weird question or a stupid question, but I don't know. Cause I never rode one of those big bikes. Do you get around faster on those things compared to a 20 inch? They're more comfortable. Definitely. But I'm saying like speed wise, like when you're pedaling, like, like, yeah, yeah, they, or do they move quicker because they're bigger bikes and their wheelbase is bigger? And they're like, do you have to, in other words, to keep up with them on a 20 inch, would I have to be pedaling more? Sounds like a stupid question. Yeah, because I went on, we went to the Buckeye bike show in Dayton, Ohio. And I thought big bikes was everywhere, right? So my, we brought our big bikes. We, my, Dylan and I were the only big bikes. It was all 20 inch. And they were working to keep up with us. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because I thought yeah. maybe, yeah. So, yeah, because I don't want to be like, the last two hey wait up guys no no <laughs> no oh, oh you're going on a 20 inch <laughs> no i'm gonna take my uh i'm it's vegas so i'm driving there but i'm gonna i'm gonna take my 20 inch but they're gonna bring me a uh you know a bigger bike for me to ride which yeah. is which is cool i'm i'm down it'll be fun it reminds me bike. well when me and dennis you know when i grew up in kansas city with dennis in the brigade we had our own crew of dudes so where we would do all day ride outs we would meet downtown you know but at the time and this is back in the day, 30, 40 people was a lot, you know yeah. what I mean? Like on BMX bikes, like what are these guys do? People were like shocked. Like they didn't know how to respond. Like what are these dudes doing all together? And now what they got thousands of people on these big bikes is crazy to like, see how much, you know, uh, it's, it's not grown from BMX, but you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. from when it was, when we did it to nowadays, a kid getting into it kind of just goes into this big thing, you know? Yeah. It's cool. It's cool. It's you very know. cool, man. It's, it's, you know, I, I don't close my mind to anything. I, Mike Buff was telling me about it. Yeah, it's cool. And I'm like, you know, and Mike likes those white and blue and red. He likes these really, they're not my colors. Right. So I ordered one of his bikes with all the colors just to get the full, I wanted the full trip that came along with it, you know, and, I, and I'm stoked. I still have it. And I love that thing. It's going to, it's going to be a sea of SE riders. Todd Lyons has like, He's like the master promoter behind all that. And he does such a great job, but um, it's yeah, all they about, sell, they sell a lot of those bikes, man, for sure. Yeah. But it's customizing your bike. You know, they'll, they paint them gold plate things. They, you know, people put stereos on the back of them. They do everything. It's a, it's a whole different trip than going to a freestyle contest completely. Yeah. You know, I, I can't wait. It's going to be fun, man. I'm pretty stoked. Um, yeah. But well, cool, man. It's been awesome talking to you. I'm excited. Yeah. I can't wait to see your new bikes. Uh, I, I would like to get a session with you at some point in, in time in life. Um, that'd cool, right. That'd be amazing. Um, what's your Instagram? And you got a website, and Instagram, and YouTube you could drop for everyone to come and check, see what you're doing. Check it out. Um, 
I'm not sure. I, I think if you just go put in RL Osborne, everything will come up. For YouTube and, and Instagram and Facebook and everything, right? Yeah, I can't remember all those names. My, no, they all have different formats. Are we running out of time? Because I got a question for you. No, we're not running out of time. I usually like to keep it like a little over an hour. Because Yeah, think that's good. Like, I think about like when I want to sit and listen to something, I don't want to listen to a three hour interview. No offense, but I no, I, I'm glad. No, not, not stuff to do. Like I got to let you go. But I mean, in life, like I'm always running around doing all these jobs that like, it's hard for me to sit down and watch a movie for an hour and a half at times. You know what I mean? So, yeah. But what was the question? So you, you made a post and, and you were like, man, you said something about, I just want things to stop for a little bit or something like that. Do you remember that? like a month ago you just you seem kind of uh like you were just getting ran crazy like well yeah i'm trying to remember the post yeah at times my situation i've raised my kids on my own meaning that like i've intentionally stayed single for the last 10 years i have no family in california and i have no one to rely on and if i don't make money and put food on the table they ain't eating you know what i'm saying i'm sure you understand that and so for me it's like you know, the, a lot of things that I faced with BMX, with the rise of being making a name for yourself and having these other opportunities outside of the sport also created a lot of envy and jealous jealousy, which actually worked against me. And then sponsors, you know what I mean? It's just been a crazy ride. So jealous I, from who? From the industry. I mean, this is back, but this is a while ago. This is back in like maybe 2008, nine, maybe. Yeah. This um, is good. I'm, I'm enjoying Sorry, yeah. you get through that, but no, no, it's it's okay. And so it just it it you know in a weird kind of way, it's like you know I really wish BMX would stop being its own worst enemy if they expect anything to grow, you know. Yeah. And and you know to reflect on what I meant earlier, when I saw you on that's incredible, I wasn't mad and talking shit about it. I was like, this is dope. This is rad. This is and so a lot of people never really understood that like, Oh, he lives in Beverly Hills. I wasn't from Beverly Hills. And you know what? I was proud of that. And I made money in a lot of different ways. There wasn't all bike riding, but it's, it's easy if when you get your start with bike riding to people forget about everything else you're doing and go and focus on like, well, he does that trick and I do this trick. So he has that. So I should have that. I was like, Bro, you need to hustle harder and quit complaining about me. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's because I'm going to still be doing what I'm doing. It isn't going to change anything, you know? Yeah. But I let it affect me, bro. That's what I'm yeah. saying. And I let it the- hurts. Criticism. It hurts, don't it? It did, but it made me tougher now. Now I don't, no, nah, whatever's. I've learned you a lot. Know, it's there. It's, it took me a long time to figure out it's them with the problem, not you. Yeah. Yeah. It's their you know perception. What I mean? but yeah. Have you ever done where you, you start, um, dumbing down or just bringing yourself down to be able to because you don't want to lose friends right so you kind of you talk maybe down about yourself or something like that to try to even the table but it don't work it doesn't work no no and i i reached i reached a point where i was like you know what dude like i've been through a lot and i just what I did to help me through all of that. And this is years ago. This isn't anyone listening. This isn't now. This is an old story. Right. You know, uh, I was, uh, I went out and rode every day and I took my GoPro and I'd set goals and I did things that make me feel good to reprogram the reason why I was in this position, the reason why I handle it, the way to handle it differently. And I analyzed myself, but it was all the therapy through the riding. And, you know, I just, I just think that when people, you know, here's an example. I was at the skate park yesterday and I was just, I overheard these kids talking and I know a couple of the skaters, they're young, but we're not friends like that. We just see each other park. And there's this other kid there. I didn't say anything. I'm just listening, put on my pads. And this dude's talking all this trash about like all these skaters and how this dude sells out and this dude doesn't ride anymore. And this dude rides for this, that, and the other. And he's just, I'm just like listening to him going like, man, that kind of talk is not going to get you where you really want to go. You know what I mean? And then the dude's talking stuff about like some of the best skaters in the world. And then he drops in to ride like the smallest bowl there and he can't really do anything on it. I was just like, dude, dude, like, like, what is like, I don't understand you. Like, like if you would spend more time, I don't even know this kid and I don't really care, but I'm just saying if you would just in general, if you spend more time talking about like what you want and not what other people are doing, if you want what other people are doing, learn how to do it, apply yourself, go into it with a, a positive outlook. But, you know, hey, everyone's got to learn things on their own. 
you know? Yeah. And I think it's easier to tear you down than confront what you went through to get there. You know what I mean? But I, I will tell you straight up now that I've been watching you and all the stuff that you're doing on, and it's impressive. And I commend you for raising your kids on your own. That is, I watched Thanks. my sister do that. That is super difficult, especially when you're trying to do all these other things, be the dad and go to the games and handle all this stuff, make the money. It's, and it's all on you, man. I, that's huge. Thanks, huge. dude. I mean, yeah. they're, they're moms in the picture, but I've had my kids the majority of the time during a breakup, yeah. our, our divorce. I mean, because I just said no one gets left behind. I, mean, I had to quit touring. I mean, yeah. I love touring. I love being on the road. That's that's why, I, listen, that's why I've been positioning myself to do comedy and do music because my kids are going to get older and they are going to move on. And that shit hurts because yeah. I've made my life them. And so I've already learned I've had detachment issues. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. they don't leave me. And because I have no one, I'm 52 years old and I ride bikes. Imagine trying to find, you know what I mean? A relationship, yeah. you know what I'm saying? A relationship's kind of hard. So for me, I just immerse myself into my work. And so, you know, it hurts. You're, you're, you're a father, you get it. Your kids get older. And that's why I was applauding you as well. You have a close family and it seems like you and your son are super close and it's the BMX bond. And I just think that that's really, really awesome. You know, I appreciate that. I got to say my wife has been super family oriented, you know, mm -hmm. and, and if it wasn't for her, uh, things might be a little different. You know, I'm just not, I'm just I'm kind of flat sometimes because I, I don't know, you know, it's like you're, you know, you're used to your adrenaline running every day and all these things going on. And then um, you get kind of tired of seeing everything. It's like, yeah, what do I do now? But uh, anyways, it's it's a huge part of her. And yeah, Dylan and I are really close. My other son and I are close and learning more about each other. So awesome. it's good. Yeah, yeah. It's well, good. life is now, dude. We got one life. Let's live it. Let's keep ripping. I'm stoked right. that everything you're doing, I'm stoked to see you riding again. Uh, I can't wait to see those bikes. You know what I mean? And it's, it's been an honor to interview. You're always one of my favorites. And uh, this is likewise, man. This is rad. No, you got a movie coming out. Like, aren't you just shooting a sequel to? No, there, we phoned a pilot for this TV series called Run Boys. Uh -huh. And uh, basically it's a pilot. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, up to them to see what they, you know, what where they right. can get the stream or air or whatever. And I think they're putting all the final touches of the pilot together before they start shopping it. So, and then I, yeah, yeah. So triple X. what about triple X? Didn't I see something come up about that? Dude, triple X is pretty cool. Uh, okay. I used to host a TV show for ESPN called five, four, three, two, one. Oh no, sorry. That was for Fox. It was called X today. <laughs> sorry. I'm confused. And and so, so that's cool that you get them mixed up because most people be like, <laughs> I was on Fox one time. You know? yeah, yeah, right. Is that ESPN or <laughs> well the, the problem that here's the deal, real quickly with me with TV. When I started doing TV, because I did it for ESPN for five years, is I I liked it, but I was always battling, like, oh, I'm a biker. Because when I was doing TV, that's when X Games was like banging. You know what I'm saying? Like, like who yeah. are these guys? This, that. And I rode my whole life to be one of those guys. I yeah. didn't ride my whole life to be like, okay, we got this big thing now, this X Games and all these opportunities and all these things going on that you dreamed of, throw it away to host a TV show. Because I said, well, they're in control of that TV show. Yeah. I'm not. I am in control of my riding. So I, I always, I wish I would have enjoyed the hosting more because I was always battling it. I was always trying to defend my riding because people are like, you don't ride anymore now, huh? Now you're doing TV, huh? You know what I mean? So, Which is just as cool, man. Just so as hard cool. to break into. Just as I cool. didn't look at it like that. I looked at it like, no, dude, I'm a bike rider, bro. I'm the bike yeah. in black. I'm a, let's do them tell whoops. Let's go. And so I got in Triple X because Vin Diesel came to the X Games in Philadelphia and I interviewed him for my show. And I had no idea who he was. And it was early in his career too, but you know, and then he liked me and put me in the film. I was like, cool. And that's how I got in that. Uh, yeah. For me, I know Tony Hawk was in it, Carrie Hart, Hoffman, uh, Mike Escamilla. I don't know how they got in it, uh, Mike Vallely. But for me, it was like Vin Diesel went straight to the director and goes, I like this dude, put him in the film. I, I can like tell him. you exactly why he did that. What is that? You want me to answer that for you? Um, and this is one thing that's really impressed me about you, not just doing bike stuff in Hollywood, but you act. 
you know, Mike Dominguez and I were on a commercial and they had the camera set up and they go, they told us both at the same time, take your shirt off, run at the camera and tell us who you are and be happy. And Mike and I looked at each other and we're like, Woo! <laughs> no, no, we were like, no, nah, no, that ain't us, man. Go to the actors. Those guys do that. We will ride. But, and I mean, we were like, I remember Mike going, um, walks up on Mike, <laughs> but you, Paul McCartney said this thing when you're singing, man, you just, your top of your head has to come off and you got to let it out. And every time I see you, you're completely in immersed into that scene, whatever it is you're doing, you don't have any uh, hangups with just getting into that part. And that's not easy to do. I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, Thanks, I could man. not act. Thanks. Yeah. Acting's fun. It's definitely a different hurry up, sit and wait kind of thing, but it's fun. Yeah. You need to actually say action. You do the scene and then just like, I gotta go sit for three more hours. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, but I thank you, man. I appreciate you so much. Um, For stand up comedy. You can, I wouldn't go in front of a bunch of people and try to tell jokes for a million bucks, man. No way. Dude, it's different, bro. It's a trip. Uh, I got my own comedy show coming up at the rainbow. Um, really? May, May 15th. Yeah. It's uh, it's called stay rad. It's Rick Thorne's stay rad comedy show. And I hired the comics yeah. and uh, I'm doing it upstairs at the rainbow. And if it goes well, I'll get it once a month. And it was all putting it together myself. I'm very I like you. I'm a very DIY kind of person. I just kind of, I believe that once you start something you want to do, starting is like half the battle. Once you start, you're in it, you know, yeah. you're in it. It's like talking about your dad doing the magazine, you start the magazine, you know where it's going to go. You start this and then you're in it and you're in it to win it. Next thing you know, it's like, what, you know? So I hope you um, see those qualities in you because you do a lot of things that aren't quite honestly scare the shit out of me, you know, putting together a T te- I could never, <laughs> would never think about that. I mean, trying to get a bike built. Yeah, I can understand that, but I, I guess that's why I'm so impressed with you is you do this stuff that really scares me that I can't do. I don't want to do. I can't do. It scares me too, bro. When you bomb, it sucks. <laughs> no, I was kidding. <laughs> no, no, that, but that's part of the deal, right? Yeah. Uh, you know? It's just like falling down riding, bro. It goes back to that. Like, man, I want to learn that trick. And then you, you know, you may get hurt or whatever the case is or a contest where you don't place as good. You're like, I'm coming back. It's like, it happens in all of it, man. It really yeah. Does. Yeah. Definitely. And then you just learn to kind of get better at it. And then it doesn't happen as much. So, yeah. Well, let me know when all this stuff goes on, man. Cause I, I love following what you do. I just don't know what to watch and when to see it, you know? Hell yeah, dude, for sure. And I'll let you know when this comes out. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time, dude. Oh, it's my pleasure. I was looking forward to this, Rick. So Stoked. thanks for having me. Hopefully I'll see you at an event. Yeah, something. absolutely, bro. All right. You're bro. like five hours from me. You live, you live, how far away are you from Santa Cruz? You're close, right? 45 minutes. Santa Cruz is farther. So I'm, okay. I'm, this is Monterey, Carmel, and Pebble Beach right here mm-hmm. on the peninsula, you know, Salinas. Um, and then you just, 45 minutes, you go to uh, Santa Cruz, which is like, if you like jumping, it's the best, man. They got all, the, every jump you could imagine there, you know? Yeah, my, Santa Cruz is great. One of my sponsors is from there. Uh, a sock company called merge for socks so next time i come up that way i'm gonna hit you up cool and uh we'll get a session in yeah we have a little uh skate park it's not doesn't have any big bowls you know but uh it's fun it's got a spine and stuff like that is that the one you post a lot that i see you posting that yeah it's like not even a mile from my house we got to go at like eight o'clock in the morning though you know otherwise it's, yeah because bikes are not allowed there but they're, they're starting to accept us. They used to call the cops on me. And now they're kind of, we get to know them a little bit, you know. Some things never change, do they? I'm like, dude, come on. That's a big deal. Yeah, right. I personally like going to the skate parks when there's not a lot of people there. And here's why. Because I want to go there and learn stuff. Like I could drive from two hours to this park or, you know, 40, an hour to this park or this park. And I'm going to go to these parks and. I'm going to do the tricks I already know, get a photo, get a line, get whatever. But if I want to learn something, I've now I go to a skate park that's like my home base. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I could do something over and over and over again, and no one's in my way. And I found a skate park that's like that. And In so, L.A.? Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I'm not going to say where it is right now. I'll tell you. No, that. yeah, I don't. Oh, because don't everybody's going to be like, I'm coming to park. And blow yeah, up right. Saying, no way. You're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, like, especially when kids are in school and I'm fortunate enough to be able to go when I want, then, you know, there's hardly any two or three people there. So I could, like, get to work, get to work, yeah. get to work. And I get my clips and stuff. And I'm able to, like, learn stuff. So then now when I go to, to a new spot, I have something new to where I can take that trick I learned over here and put it over here. You know how it works. Yeah. You know, so I know it's like when I'm dropping in and I hear a skateboarder, I'm like, man, I don't want to like be going over his spine and that skateboard's like going to be right under there. I struggle enough with a spine as it is, but yeah, uh, but it's cool. We, we have this like understanding there now kind of That's cool. Uh, works out pretty good. So. Yeah. And, and I will say this before I go. One thing that I think parents need to inform their kids is that a skate park is not a jungle gym. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if your kid wants to go on swings and shit and like slides, that's over there. Yeah. It's a skate park. And they have their kids like running around without nothing, just like on foot, like parkour. And I'm like, dude, like I know their kids and they, they don't know any different. I get it. Yeah. But they should do a course at school. Yeah. It says skate parks is not a parkour event. <laughs> yeah. Or, or yeah. you know, or a, a place to do parkour or or just stand there on the flat bottom like ah or so, let your dog run around. I I came yeah, off a yeah. double one time and there's a little dog right down there and I'm like he's going to die. <laughs> and luckily he moved, right? And the guy just lets him run free and I'm like, "Well, that's going to happen, you know." Yeah, this park this park is not there, but anyways <sighs> anyways well have a, listen dude have a great day i appreciate you taking the time and uh stay rad dude i'll talk to yeah, you soon. keep me posted on your stuff too i will for sure all right all keep right, it up man you. good to Much see love, you brother all right see ya peace i don't even know how to turn this thing off so I'll go go over there the side where it says end you find it it's red bottom left leave or bottom right bottom left. right, it says bottom leave. right. Leave. Oh, leave works too. Okay. Okay.